I'm able to hear everything. Oh, perfect. I'm going to mute myself for the rest of the call, if that's all right. I have kids here. Yeah, you're all good. So it grays out. I don't know what's going on here. It grays out the silver. So I'm just going to close that window. Yeah, that's fine. Because we can open it from. Yeah. Yep, no problem. Yeah, that works. Because I'll be pointing at slides for periods of time. So then we'll go to, from here, we'll just hop over to the foundation's website. We'll do, I mean, so the scale may have a, may have a direct. Nope, not reload. Um, duplicate, you can go there and you can go. Move good stuff, yes. All right. I, th I think that we can we can start recording whenever you're ready. It's recording. Oh, great. Yeah. All right. So, hi everybody. Here we are for this is this is what class five, which is very exciting. We're coming along. We're we're moving our way through all of the different things we have done. Git and web development and and sort of started that journey. Woodworking was exciting. I think it was a lot of fun over the course of the week. It was neat to see lots of you here many times working through projects. It was a lot of fun. And then now we're going to start a whole new realm, another one of the like main thirds of Makehaven, which is the sewing and textiles area, which is this, the big section right here in the middle where Megan is our, our lead facilitator. And there's lots of exciting things going on all the time. So uh, we're just going to take a look at the website. We're going to see sort of how that, how that looks, what is up there. And then I've got a set of slides prepared where we're gonna go over like the, the broad scale items that you would wanna consider when you're thinking about if, if you're just like wandering through a joy in fabrics, wondering what kind of fabric based hobbies could I absorb? And so we'll sort of look at them that way just to give you a sense for what those words are and what they mean, how they're similar and different from each other. Some definitional pieces also will be really important. Uh, just to make sense, a little bit better sense of where all these pieces fit together and some context for understanding fabrics a bit more. And then from there, we're also going to take a look at like what are possible steps and then where we're going the next week also. Because the two textile weeks are related. This one is, is the first like just sewing and putting things together. And then the next one is definitely more focused on taking that and applying electronics to it. So getting electronics mixed in with your textiles, which is a fun thing to do. So can we hop over to the website? Because that's exciting. I love the infinite tunnel. <laughs> all right, so in here. One second, I just need to cut it over for the recording. Yeah, you're all good. OK, so on the website, there's this is the textiles and sewing page. So down here, I just want to point out, and I. I put in the Slack chat for during class. Over the course of this past week, lots of interesting things happened. One was there was a video put out by a YouTuber where they showed the difference between a rip cut blade and a cross cut blade on a table saw, which is worth watching. But another one is that the Barcelona Fab Lab put out that they have a la carte Fab Academy, which is an entire course sort of like ours, uh, but an entire course focused just on fabric and textiles. So you can go far, far deeper with all of this material. And it's really neat that it's available. It's available in uh, English, and most of it is also in Spanish. So those are all things that you can take a look at while you're doing your stuff. 
Uh, but I just wanted to highlight that Fabric Academy is a neat extension of what we're doing here. So there's lots to learn there. And Barcelona is always very fashion forward. So they're regularly on top of, of doing nice fashion shows with the things that they make. So if you want to go at a very high level, it's interesting to announce that that is something that's available like right now. Um, and as you're working on what's going to happen this week, the big, one of the big things is to make sure that you get your badges so that you're able to come back to that area and do anything that you need. So I think if I were to make any recommendations, there's the standard sewing machine badge and then sewing stretchy materials badges. Those I think would be good options. And you'd, you'd want to message Megan through Slack to try and get that set up. And she's, she's over there busy. Otherwise, we'd wave at her and say hi. But you know, she's, she's doing her thing, giving somebody a badge. <laughs> yeah. Oh, come on up and talk to the. Um, today I was like working on getting the badges, so I was watching the videos, and it doesn't seem like there's any content for the stretchy fabric. That is a great point. So, the 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 stretchy fabrics badge is one that I know has has been. I've had interesting discussions with Kate and Jr. about the stretchy fabric badge itself, and I know that I link it in there, and there's not a ton of content. Really, we're going to get to the difference and what those two things are. And it was just, I was getting my sewing badge and Megan said, oh, you should also do this. And, and then it's just sort of rolled in there. It's an important distinction that I think, I, I'm happy to admit that this is an area of growth for me as, as well. Like to understand everything of fabrics and textiles. I've got like my feet in the water, but I'm still learning plenty. But just to make sense of the importance of the distinction between a straight stitch and a zigzag stitch, like to draw the importance of those two different pieces, it was important to the textile facilitators that they be separate badges. So there's a, there's a really important value in those, and we're going to take a look at those stitches in a minute. But it, you're right. It doesn't feel like it's a thing, but if you're getting the sewing machine badge, it'll be super easy to tack on at the same time. So message, and we're, we'll, we'll see more in a little bit. So. Jared, can we hop over to the website? Can I alt-tab to it? Uh, okay. Yeah, we can alt-tab to it. Okay. Cool. All right. So we are taking, do you need the mouse for a minute? So in here, if we're taking a look at all of these, there's some slides that we're going to look at in a minute. But I just wanted to point out that there's several different concepts that are laid out here. We, we're going to talk about knits and weaves, hand sewing a little bit. Um, we're going to go through sort of the modern sewing machine pieces and the value of these different stitches. And then this sort of lays out all those pieces. The assignments at the end of this week are going to be essentially to try something in the textiles and fabrics field, which could be sewing a face mask, which is a project that was done quite a bit here several months ago. And so there's, there's lots of experience built up around that. There's many different styles of face masks that you can make. Um, or to screen print a t-shirt if you wanted to work with that. Screen printing is an interesting related skill to some of the textiles and sewing pieces. It's, it's another awesome way to go. A screen printed t-shirt can really make a nice statement. And then um, Megan also has some good starting sewing projects like making a t-shirt bag. So, and, and there's tons of examples, basically sort of like we did with woodworking, find something that you want to do that's related to fabrics and textiles and just make it real and I'm here to help in any way that I can. So with that, we're gonna hop over to these slides. Should I leave them, should I make them presented or leave them as they are? Any preference there? Okay, cool. Gotcha. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about clothing and textiles and it's some, there's several pieces that I just wanna say briefly, but as we think about clothing and textiles, it's often something, oh, it's often something that can, can feel, that can get forgotten because it's so constant in our lives, they become just like commodities that pass in and out. They're, they're not a thing that we wonder at in the same way you'd look at a 3D printer and like wonder how it works, right? A shirt is a shirt and you're, you're often like, you're just frustrated that you need to do the laundry again, more than anything else. So it's good to take a minute and just slow down for, for me in my perspective with them, because this is not necessarily my strongest area, but it's something that I'm increasingly interested in because it's so frequently a part of the world that we interact with. Um, another p 
piece is that we need to make some sense of fabrics in general. So if we're trying to take all of the different fabrics that you interact with in your daily life and break them down into the most reductionist set of categories that we can, we've essentially got like two or three categories. You've got your weaves, which is a plaid shirt, like the one that I'm wearing now, where your threads are laid out straight and then aligned close together. And then you've got knits that are more like a t-shirt or a sweater where there's a lot of curves in the threads, in the, in the filaments themselves, so that they curve back in on themselves. So if you, you know, you take a look down at whatever it is that you happen to be wearing right now. And so if you're wearing, like I'm wearing plaid, just looking at this, I can see that it's got these long straight line segments that run through it. And if you're wearing a t-shirt, which I'm wearing a t-shirt underneath, you can see little curls in the texture of the material itself. Those little curls in the texture of the material qualify it as a knit, which is different from the weave where the fibers are laid down straight. So it's interesting to just take a look at the things that are immediately around you and see how they fit, right? I'm also wearing jeans, which would fall into that weave category. And so you, it's interesting to look at the different materials that are constantly around you and see how that plays. Face masks, when made, they're almost always made out of a, or a lot of them are made out of a weave instead of a knit. A knit will generally pass a little bit more air through, so having a weave for a face mask makes tons of sense. And then the official doctor level ones are sort of in between. And so we'll get to an in between. Felts are, are sort of like an in between space for those. So when you have a felted material, it's often a matted material is, is sort of what it would be like or we'll see that it's just fibers that are sort of tacked together. There's a few ways to make a felt, um, but it's one of the things that, we'll, that hair would naturally do on its own, if just left unattended and uncleaned. It's common for wools to, to felt together. And so you've got lots of different things that we can take a look at with, with that. <laughs> You're going crazy over here, JR. All right. Whoop, can we? Get the slides back up. Cool, all right, so in addition to this, we've got our examples over here. These are a weave, and here's a knit, just sort of drawn bare so that you can see what's going on in these places. And if we click on to the next slide, I just wanted to throw this up here and not make a ton of comment, but one of the things that has dominated uh, textiles is, has been a gender bias. And it's something that, like, growing up as a kid, I was not encouraged to try the sewing machine but it's something that's worth at least acknowledging. So I don't wanna, knowing that I'm a straight white man, I don't wanna dwell here for very long, but I just figure it's worth a tip of the hat. There's a very good book about this called The Subversive Stitch that's worth reading. If you're interested in like the role of a quiet strength that a, a seamstress or a person who really understands their fabric can, can have in the world. It's a fascinating read, uh, would really encourage it. And I would love to be as strong as some of the, the female leaders in this field. It would be great. I aspire to get there at some point. But that, that, you know, that said, without trying to get too political, I know where to try and keep my mouth shut sometimes, is the process of making fabrics. So fabrics in general, when made on an industrial kind of scale, have definitely automated processes that are doing that. So there's two broad categories for these machines. On the left, we have a weaving machine, and on the right, we have a knitting machine. And so those are broken into two categories. Um, when JR is done with the mouse, which is totally fine. Okay, cool. Um, this one over here, these are the weaving machines, and these are the knitting machines. I'm just gonna let them both play a little bit. But as, as they go, they're both set to silent, so you can see sort of the differences in the mechanisms. On the weaving looms, You've got straight lines of, of textiles, uh, straight lines of yarn or string or thread that are being laid down and packed into place. So you can see it pushing that down into the weave and you get these plaid structures that come from long straight lines. And so they're fed in at crazy high speeds. These are showing how many lines you can print into the, into the weave at the same time or in a, in a certain amount of time. So this is like a trade show of the highest speed weaving machines that you can find, which is pretty wild to see how quickly they're able to churn out fabric. And it's the fabric that we'd use on a regular basis, right? They're just making a standard plaid with that. That's sort of beyond what we'd find at Makehaven, but it's an interesting, 
process to see that those machines exist, that that's, a pr that that's a piece that can be done, and then it's controlled programmatically. So the designs are all set up by computer numerical control where you have different colors that are laid down and they get compressed into shape. And then on the other side, we've got these circular knitting machines, which are fascinating because you're looping the, the threads back over themselves to get those shapes. And so they turn out these tubes of fabric that then can be sliced into sheets of fabric. Just by the nature of the knitting, it has to be done in such a way that it can be turned into a tube with a continuous loop. And so when you think about like a t-shirt, t-shirts often don't have a seam. Some, some t-shirts don't have a seam around the waist. And so they can be one continuous tube of fabric that's just cut in such a way that you put arms, a neck, and a, and a torso coming out of it. So there's some interesting pieces for how these machines work. And when you think about the scale of a machine like that, the engineering that it would take to build it, it's really a marvel that it exists. Uh, they're also super dangerous, right? Never stick your finger in there kind of things. Uh, just because they're moving so fast and so high speed that there's lots of different interesting pieces to having something made that quickly. But this is sort of the understructure that exists to our entire textile industry. When we think about the happiest parts of it. But then there's the, the sad parts of the textile industry that, that are worth commenting on as well. And if I knew more, I would be happy to comment on like the role of people around the world who are underpaid and underserved within the textiles industry that deserve more recognition and more pay. Like that's, those are all pieces of this pipeline that are worth commenting on and having a broader discussion than we can really do here. But it's good to see sort of the process for where these things come from, the mechanistic pieces, but then also to try and understand a little bit better the, the social role that, this, that the textile industry plays in the world as well. So there's, there's lots of dynamics to this. We're just gonna pause and move on and think about the third type of fabric. Think about felting. So this is, these are felt uh, figurines. This is actually made by a friend of mine back in Cleveland. She by hand takes animal wool, will color it, and then she'll stab it with a, a needle, a felting needle, and you can make fully three-dimensional geometries with felt. There's, you can also felt a, a weave like this so that it becomes soft and fuzzy or like in a, in a hoodie, which is a knit, you do that on the inside so you get that fuzzy inside to the hoodie. And so you can felt lots of things, but when you take wool and you felt it in just the right way, you can get it to stick together in really structured forms. So my friend who I, I really hope that we can work out a time where I can be on a call with her and we can have her be our first guest speaker. Sam makes these lovely little sculptures out of felt that are just adorable. She, sell, she sells them on Instagram or through Instagram, so you could buy them there if you wanted. Uh, but it's just a fascinating technique to be able to take this and build structures. And actually some very high-end art uses this to add, not, maybe not to make sculptures out of felt, but in order to make very structured pieces of fabric. So if you'd like to have detail in a scarf where there's some raised structures, but not necessarily a stitch or a seam, you can do needlepoint felting so that you build that structure in. And what you're doing is really taking, instead of weaving where you bind in straight lines all of the things or in knits or, or in knits where you make knots essentially, uh, felt is where you're just sort of pushing the molecules together until they bind and hook by their, their vagaries, by like the weirdness of the shape. They just sort of knot together. And so you get a felting pattern that comes from that so that you can build structures in that way. It's a fascinating process that I don't know a ton about, which is why I'd love Sam to talk with all of us. And so I'm gonna try and set that up for later on in the week. Um, but yeah, so can we click on in the next one? Cool, maybe, whoops. Okay. So let's say, let's say all of those, there's many, many pieces to like understanding fabrics and sort of how they fit together in the world, but let's, What's often gonna be the case here is you're not gonna be making the fabric yourself, probably. Uh, it's very likely that you're going to have either a fabric or a thread that was made ahead of time. And so essentially what I've done here is just try to collect together all of the different uh, skills that would be, that we could list out and sort of identify what they are, how they relate to each other, and then bring those ideas together so we can process them and make sense of which categories were, you'd be interested in pursuing later on this week because there's a lot of options, really. There's tons of different ways that this can be put together. So we're gonna start with hand sewing and stitch work, and then machine sewing, and then fiber arts, then some heavy duty stuff, and then eventually we'll get to screen printing at the end. So, 
And th this is another, there's two quotes, but I really love this one. Yeah, for me now, it does not matter whether what I do in my studio complies with a minor or major language, whether it is a kind of art or sort of textile. Whenever I feel a definition coming on, I try to remember to ask myself who constructed the definition, who needs the oppositional distinctions, and who is going to benefit from them, and why should I comply with those codes and conventions? It feels lovely and defiant all at once, this quote. And I think it does a great job with textiles, inviting us to question sort of what it is about the world that has become so common, what roles is it asking us to put in place, and how can we subvert those? It feels not only like a, a, a part of that sort of questioning our reality piece that textiles can often invite, but also as a maker, right? We're trying to build our world in interesting ways. It's a fascinating concept and an idea, and one to just to just dwell on for a minute. Um, but I was about to click on to the next slide. <laughs> Sorry. You're doing great. Okay. And then we click on. So hand sewing and stitch work. There, these are what I would call the classic stitches. So if we're just going through what are the classic stitches that you would want to learn if you're trying to learn how to sew carte blanche, you'd want to try and figure out at least one or two of these stitches. You've got the running stitch where the thread is sort of going up and down through the fabric. The base stitch, which is sort of that, but a little bit larger. A back stitch where you loop forward and back through a material. An invisible ladder stitch where there's sort of a fold and you stitch within the fold. And each one of these is really hard to see without geometry and practice and play to make sense of it all. Learning how to sew is very much like learning the knots that you need for rock climbing or sailing. It's something that's best done through practice and someone who's good at it has a hard time verbalizing. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty good at tying a knot. Sit, stitching, I've got one or two that I feel like I can do well. A whip stitch is, is one that I can do pretty effectively. But of those, that's, that's probably it for the one that I feel like I can consistently do, get it well placed and get it laid out nicely. Um, but as you get better sewing by hand, you can really master these basic stitches and get on to more complicated ones that really let you expand what you're doing. Each one of these has its own role and purpose, just like a knot does. A figure of eight knot is an important one for a rock climber. Uh, and then you've got other sorts of knots that are useful, like a, a bow line is good for tying and releasing a knot. There, there's lots of different places where these would have a context and a space where they're useful. And so understanding that would be to go a little bit deeper in each one of them. Some of them are for show. Uh, some of them hold together frayed edges, like a blanket stitch is good for holding together the edges of a blanket. The, the whip stitch I'm often using to tie things down so that they're tied to a fabric. Like you might have seen, I put an EL wire on my backpack that was tied down with a whip switch, a uh, whip stitch. And then there's different roles for different purposes. Like the invisible switch would obviously keep things a little bit tidier because it stays out of view. And as we're doing that, it's also worth mentioning sewing scissors which is totally a worthwhile pursuit. Um, my, I, my mother watches these recordings, so let me say very plainly, I have fond memories of being yelled at for touching the sewing scissors as a kid. It was very important that you did not cut anything but fabric or thread with the sewing scissors. Um, and that's for good reason. Scissors like that are very well made, they're often very expensive, and fabric is one of the softest materials out there very often. So cutting fabric with sewing scissors uh, doesn't, doesn't dull them at all, and so staying sharp is best done by exclusively allowing them to be done with, to exclusively allowing those scissors to cut fabric. So it's a neat thing. Uh, if you have these little teeth on it, it helps with fraying the edges. So if you cut with that zigzag scissors, if the edges start to fray, it usually stops it a little bit earlier than having threads that can pull fully out of the fabric. So it's a good way to build in a little bit of strength to your stitches. Let's see, and then can we, whoops. I think we can click on to the. But those basic stitches very, very quickly give way to the decorative nature of a stitch, right? When you think about why your garments are stitched together the way that they are, sometimes it's practical and sometimes it's for looks. On jeans, there's a lot of stitching that's done exclusively for looks. Like when you think about the arches that are on the back pockets, or you think about stitches that run down the length of your leg. Sometimes they're there just for the appeal. 
Sometimes they're there uh, to add a little extra strength. There's lots of different reasons why you might stitch. But often, doing something decorative is an important piece. I think my, I had a grandmother who would wear like sweaters that had lots of decorative stitches and, and fall leaves hand stitched all across them that she had done throughout her life that she had made. And so you can have these decorative stitches that really can add a lot of excitement and, and flair to a piece. And when they're hand done, it shows, it's lovely. Uh, there's been a big trend of ugly Christmas sweaters over time, and those aren't exactly stitched. They're sort of woven in different ways, but in the, in the most classic ones, not the ones that you can buy in bulk, uh, but the, the classic ones that you find at a thrift store that someone's grandmother made, those are often stitched in a way where the stitches themselves or the weaves themselves, they add the decoration and the flair in the ugly, lovable way that, that we've all come to enjoy, right? So those are, decorative stitches are really an important piece of understanding sewing and hand sewing as, as it's put together. Another important skill that comes along with stitching is cross stitch and the needlepoint. So cross stitch and needlepoint are really interesting and fascinating hobbies where you have a sort of mesh substrate fabric where you can use thread of different color to make little X's or little crosses to stitch things together. And so there's a, a Ruth Bader Ginsburg one. There's a lovely whole subculture of putting swearing in your cross stitch, which I really enjoy, but wasn't sure how much I should push it on these slides. Uh, but it's a lot of fun to see what people will put, what vulgar, vulgar things people will put into cross stitch, because it's such a sweet medium. Uh, this, this house here to cover up a tissue box was a mainstay in a Midwestern house. Uh, it totally was it. Of the houses I would pass through as a kid, I think most of them had that little cross stitch piece. It's a hard plastic grid instead of a fabric grid like the, the two on the left. But that hard plastic piece could be then sewn together with yarn by hand to get a structural piece that would cover your tissue box just to make it look a little nicer than a standard tissue or Kleenex box. So those are, those are all things. And then there's patterns that exist where you can find designs to put memes into cross stitch. And then lace work is incredibly phenomenal. And there's a link here to a video of a, of a lady doing the lace work. And I would really encourage you at some point to watch that happen. It's mesmerizing and I have no idea how it works. Like it's, it's just one of those things that in my mind is still very much deep earth magic. Uh, and, and not to say that it is, right? But it's, it's a skill that's absolutely fascinating uh, to watch happen because I have no idea what's going on. It's a series of knots and that's all I've got. Beyond that, it's a series of pins into, into pillows, but we'll see. So those are all sort of hand sewing skills, whether it's a stitch or a uh, decorative embroidery stitch or whether we're talking about thinking about your needlepoint and cross stitch or lace work. Those are all hand done pieces. But then we can consider machine stitches, which bring us into here. So we've got a quick comparison as we transition from one to the other. A hand sewn thing is going to have the stitch go on to both sides of the material. And it's often stronger than a machine stitch where you can see the green and the orange in this image. Uh, these are interlocked through a piece of fabric. And so the top and the bottom, because they're being assembled by a machine, the bottom comes up a little bit and the top comes down a little bit and then they hook and interloop. It's a very quick way to make a stitch. It holds materials together very nicely. But if the two threads, if either of them starts to fail, the whole thing can unravel. And I'm sure we've each had a garment that we enjoyed that where one of the threads came loose that was holding it together, a stitch, and then the whole thing seemed to fall apart, right? That's an experience that many of us have had because lots of those garments were made by a machine. And so the machine stitch, once it starts to fall apart, it can really drastically come apart quickly. But with that, you're on it, JR. This is going great. We can break stitching in machines into a series of categories. So sewing machines, there's lots of two thread sewing machines where we have the standard machine. Uh, and so there's some modern machines and antique sewing machines here at Makehaven. Then we've got CNC embroidery machines where there's the brother embroidery machine that you could take a look at. Uh, there's the heavy duty fabricator and uh, a couple other large machine or one machine over there that's really meant for tents and sails and canvases and leather, those heavy duty materials or for like upholstery on a, a leather couch even. And then there's multiple stitch sewing machines. So the, the serger and a few other machines can handle more than just two sources of thread at one time. 
So there's lots of options here for how you can put things together. And all of these different machines have their different roles and purposes. For right now, I would totally recommend you stick to the standard machine if you're just getting started. There's lots of, there's plenty of good things that can be done in there. Oh, is that somebody in the meet? So over here on the left, this is just a guide to that Singer sewing machine. We have two of these. Uh, they have names, which is, uh, I'm not sure what, Beyonce and Agatha maybe. Yeah, they're, they are named in Make Haven. They're given names. And so this is sort of the, the detail work for how those function. That there's a bobbin in the bottom that spins, that there's a needle at the top that comes up and down into that bobbin to pull and engage that knot that we saw before to compare the two. There's a series of different stitches that can happen, but often it's just one or two like core stitches for a sewing machine. But really, like when you get to the one or two core stitches, you've got your straight stitches and your zigzags. So if you're curious, uh, Jamie, like you asked about the sewing machine versus the stretchy materials, essentially the sewing machine badge is for a straight line stitch where you've got a weave that isn't going to expand very much when you pull on it. And the zigzag gives you a little bit of play so that if the material stretches and the stitching doesn't, those zigzags can straighten themselves out with the stretch or recompress back to how they were sewn. So the zigzag really offers some flexibility to sew together stretchy materials, even if the thread itself isn't stretchy. So it's an interesting dynamic and something that is important to understand if you want to sew together t-shirts into materials because the knit will let it stretch and expand quite a bit, whereas a weave wouldn't. And so a straight line stitch like on, on a face mask would be more appropriate. So understanding the dynamic for those is really an important piece of moving forward. And then once you have those two things that a machine can do, there's actually just tons of different options, right? You, how much do you step to the right or to the left? How much do you move the threads forward or back? You can get all of these complicated stitches to come out of a simple machine once you've just got a few basic motions. If you're modulating, how much do you move? What's the ratio? And I can imagine someone who's tinkering with a sewing machine, adjusting settings as they go through and, and trying to decide, oh, what is it? what's this next good looking stitch that I can try? Right, there's lots of those permutations on these two core ideas of a straight line stitch and a zigzag stitch that really let this proliferation of stitches happen. So we've got that. Another important piece is that there's a dynamic to having those two threads, the top and the bottom one fit and work, where you need to have just the right amount of balance in your sewing machine. Because you want to have that joint where the two threads come together be sort of in the plane of the material. You don't want it to be above the material or below. If it's too tight, you get this bunching of the material. And if it's too loose, you get those loops that can really be problematic. And often I've had a sewing machine jam because the thread was too loose, right? And so you had extra space and then it gets caught in the stitches and you can have all sorts of problems. Getting the right balance for tension is, is definitely an art. There's, there's certainly a piece to each machine where it has its own spirit and you need to learn how your thread works with that material combination. And uh, according to Megan, who now is available to wave at us all, Megan promises that there's definitely a lot of depth to learning the dynamics of thread versus a fabric, right? Yeah. Well, you have to adapt the needle and the thread of the fabric together. Do you want to come over here and say that to the microphone? Thank you very much. <laughs> there's Hi. just, come on over here, right in front of this. Oh, okay. Hello, You're doing everybody. Um, yeah, so you just want to make sure there's the right fit between the thread and the needle and the fabric. Megan, can you introduce yourself? Just oh, I'm Megan. I'm a sewing facilitator, and we also just got a new sewing facilitator named Young. Um, I don't actually know what her hours are, but mine are Mondays, 5.30 to 8.30. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, yeah. That was great responding. Oh, if you've got examples, absolutely. Sure, yeah. So, for example, I just made a sewing, um, a sewing machine, a swimsuit this summer, and so I wanted to use a polyester thread so that it would be okay in water. Um, and I used a stretch needle for the extremely stretchy fabric. And so I just like Googled what to use on this fabric. And then someone, just like always an article about everything. So someone told me what to do. Cool, all right. Thank you. Thank you. We'll do a little. Thanks for hopping in. That's some great improv skills. All right. So let's see, we'll hop over back to the other. So. Our sewing facilitators are as wonderful as Megan. They've got tons of information for you, and they've, they've definitely got the resources to point you in the right direction.
Um, but one of the things that it's worth mentioning, when, we, when we're talking about sewing machine, you really have a proliferation of clothing and then clothing as it impacts a culture. So we've got, as soon as sewing machines really showed up in earnest in the 1700s, which is before photographs became uh, possible, you've got styles that start to proliferate. So different cultures develop their own art, uh, styles. And that was true before sewing machines, but they really became almost solidified in a way that, that was based, the machines would be changed in order to make the things that they were trying to make. So there's some interesting and fascinating things to look at there. But as a, as a kid, I remember being taken to Joanne Fabrics where people would flip through these templates that you could buy and then make your own shirts or dresses or whatever. And you'd get these like thin paper designs so that you could make a garment that you wanted to. And then we've got like a blue dress form over in the side of the room. Those sorts of things would become commonplace so that you could build your article of clothing right on there. And, and when made by hand, since those stitches tend to be a lot stronger, they're often far more durable items, things that are more of an heirloom kind of piece when you make your own clothing from hand or by hand. So there's, there's plenty of, there's an entire industry based around fashion, obviously, where you've got fashion artists and fashion design, people who are seamstresses and tailors who can build these beautiful garments of all different kinds, adding the structure and the pieces that we all need in order to keep going. So there's tons of backstory and careers and opportunity around clothing and how that dynamic fits together. Let's see, can we hop over to the next one? Yep. But it really extends quite a bit. So there's no way that we're gonna cover it all. We're just gonna keep zooming through looking at different sewing machine based skills. And so quilting is another one. Right? Quilts are often made by sewing together patches of fabric. The geometry in a quilt can be a fascinating thing. There's actually entire fields of math around quilting also, uh, but you can build these geometries that can make these lovely heirloom pieces that can really express a lot. I've seen people make quilts out of t-shirts, quilts out of just scraps of fabric, quilts that are thick and matted that are very heavy and dense, quilts for a brand new baby, quilts for uh, uh, an aging parent that needs to stay in one place. There's, there's lots of different reasons why you might build a quilt for, for people and how you can do it. Uh, there's sort of science-y star-based ones. There's often a theme. It's a really well-loved skill. And I remember on PBS flipping through the channels, there'd be a, a, an adorable quilting show with these lovely ladies who would talk about their quilting experience and like the process for making different and very advanced designs that I have no idea how they actually worked. Uh, but it was always lovely to just sort of watch for a few minutes to see what they're up to. It's another lovely visual piece where you can mix in and you can even express art and designs more than just geometries as you get further and further. And it's a great place to practice your stitching and to better understand sort of the dynamic of multiple layer fabric pieces put together. So let's see, hopping over here. But that brings us to the end of machine stitching, uh, that section. And now we can look at fiber arts in general when we're thinking about those put together. So in here, one of the, the core pieces is by hand weaving. And so by hand weaving is a really fascinating process where you can use a loom to put together different materials. And there, there's a large and lo lengthy uh, heritage of weaves being a part of cultures, right? Here's a, a Peruvian lady and di different parts of the world where people have been using looms for a long time to make scarves or clothing or garments, blankets, all sorts of different textiles just made from a, a loom like this where you take and you're weaving together your materials in long straight patches. So those let you set up colors, they let you build sort of thick, sturdy, hardy materials. And this is what we saw done with those, those automated machines, but just on a slower human scale, right? So in here, you're able to do all of that building process where you can make all of the different sorts of things that you'd want to from there. There's lots of great cultural heritage that comes with woven fabrics. And it's really fascinating to see sort of what styles and designs developed over centuries and even millennia. There's, there's early records of woven fabrics that come from way in the past. Uh, next is knitting and crochet. And there's this lovely video that I, I would play, but I think we need to keep moving. They're not the same. I don't want you to mix them up. It's very clear if you talk to a person who knits or who crochets, they do not want you to get them confused. So this video you can reference later. Uh, but she explains the difference. For cro the short, short version is crochet has the needles, 
and knitting is done with the, the two sticks. So knitting first, where you've got your knitting needles. These are large needles, and essentially it's defined by having an entire row of knots all done at once. And so you've got a whole series of knots that knitting ties together in one go, which is different from crochet where the knots are tied one at a time. So that's the, the core difference. And because you've got many different knots happening at the same time, there's really only one or two possible ways to knot those together. There's, it's not nearly as diverse as the set of skills that you can use when you crochet, but you can build all sorts of different interesting things when you're putting things together in this sort of format. So there's lots of options for how to build stuff, and, and there's many interesting things that have been made through knitting. Um, and then continuing on, crochet is a related field for sure. It's not the same though, so don't mix them up. But you've got these crochet hooks, and those hooks let you tie interesting knots, as you can imagine spinning them and pulling and getting the, the link between the materials to be different. You can get lace-like items. You can build structural pieces. There's plenty of good crocheted like trivets. Those are great to make. Uh, people love to get those as holiday gifts. If you're planning your project, that could be a good way to go, just to build some lovely trivets for people. But as we're thinking about knitting and crocheting, they often fill a similar void. But because there's more knots available in crochet, you can do a lot more varieties of things with it. And then macrame is another one that takes fibers and it makes interesting shapes. This is more, I would say, knot-based, where you're really tying those knots almost by hand. So you're able to use the interplay between different ropes and materials to make this relationship something that's established. It's often done in very symmetric patterns with long, drapey pieces. So like a macrame shawl is often very nice. These things that remind me a lot of dream catchers are interesting, and they have different roles in different places. So you've got lots of opportunity here to use special knots to make things work. And it, it makes me think of, I went to Mystic, Connecticut uh, over the summer, and there's a knot shop there where they have a whole series of pieces of art based around knots and macrame work. So there's tons of interesting opportunity around this where the dynamics of how you tie these knots and how you strain these fibers together can make interesting patterns. So there's tons of interesting opportunities there. And then lace which is, again, a fascinating process. And it's essentially sort of, it's a lot like a macrame, but done on a very, very small scale. So it's delicate. Uh, it's, it's often very much considered a feminine sort of material. And it's very much embraced in, in lots of those motifs. It's something that um, my, my wife is half Polish. She, she would love to tell you it's a Polish art to make lace. Many cultures have lace, though. Um, so it's just an interesting development, it's one of those things that shows up and can really display a culture in lots of different ways. Lace is often such a well-liked material that it's integrated into other garments as a top covering. It's very, very common in lingerie and other like very feminine pieces. So those are all important parts to try and understand. But it is makeable by hand. For a long time, that's, that's how it was produced. And so this image down here in the bottom with these large series of pins those are sort of how you hold the piece in place as you tie a series of very tiny knots to make lace into the structure that it is. So it's a really fascinating process uh, that I'm, I'm not going to even pretend to understand, but where you use those pins as a baseline to get the tension and strings that you'd want in order to tie up knots to build this sort of a structure. So there's lots of interesting opportunity to make beautifully delicate pieces with that. And you can see that they even have played historical roles where you can have it as like a tapestry to communicate over time, depending on the level of artistry that the person has who's building the pieces. So it's an interesting historical context to this one, and then culturally very much still relevant. But then we get down to our heavy duty section, and I just want to talk about these pieces a little bit because they have lots of application in our lives as well. Uh, we can talk about upholstery, which is around us almost all the time. Uh, Ruby is sitting in an upholstered chair, but there are many of those around this space. There's lots of them all over the place in cars in different places. We have a rug tufting gun we want to talk about and a few other things. So upholstery is a process that's a fascinating way to add a, a little touch of softness to furniture. Right? We can sit in hard wooden things and when you're a woodworker, you might want to build yourself a wooden chair as a pinnacle of your woodworking. But at the end of the day, my favorite chair has always been one that's upholstered, right? In some form or another where it's soft, you can sort of settle in, watch a movie, fall asleep. All of those things make me very happy, especially on a cold winter's day. So 
having just a little bit of hygge in your life is really important, and having a nice upholstered chair can be a part of that. So adding in upholstery is definitely a part of fabrics and textiles, but because of the nature of furniture, you need to have it be a little bit more robust, a little bit sturdier, because you can imagine little kids climbing over a, an upholstered chair, a couch needing to be picked up and moved around. There needs to be a certain level of sturdiness to a piece that's upholstered. Uh, so, that, so that's definitely a piece to take into account, but upholstery shows up beautifully in furniture. It can also serve sort of a historical purpose where you have these interesting woven pieces that are baked into your woodworking chairs. It's in our cars. It's in all sorts of different places where upholstery will just show up uh, even though you may have forgotten that it's there, right? And so understanding how to make that with a sewing machine like our serger can add a nice level to a piece that would be made in woodworking and otherwise just be a hard surface. So adding a little bit of batting, a little bit of padding, uh, like there's a, a giant bag of over here that Megan brought in just now. Those would all be interesting ways to add a little bit of softness to a piece that would otherwise be, be tough. There's also lovely rivets and stitches and other things that you can do with that. So let's keep going. Rug tufting is a fascinating one. JR got a rug tufting gun, and I would strongly encourage you to check that out. Uh, there's the badging video shows the process of like a rug tufting class. And then I found this lovely video of this artist who's a master rug maker. So she uses a rug tufting gun to draw custom design rugs. And you get this piece of um, yarn that's pushed through a sort of a substructure, a fabric that's got a, a wide grid. The yarn is pushed through in these hooks that can stay either fully maintained loops or often you'll cut them off so that you have a frayed edge. So if you're thinking about like a shag rug, this is very much a shag rug where you've got long extensions of yarn or fabric that come through. This is the backside of that, of that shag rug. But down at the bottom, you can see what the front is like. And we've all been in a room with a shag rug before. So you can imagine this, but the nice part about a tufting gun is that it allows you to add that yarn in exactly the shape and color that you'd like. So as you feed in that color and that material, you get to have the weave and the look that you'd want. And by choosing that, designing it, and using the back as a template, you can really draw out the, the reverse of what you'd want the front to be. So if you have a specific idea of what you'd like a rug to be in a room or in a space, you can make that yourself by hand using a rug tufting gun, which we have one of here. Uh, and it's fascinating. You need a sort of a substructure, a frame, but it's totally possible. So those, uh, that's a great heavy duty material. Another way that you can build a rug is a rag rug. This is another one that was a, a Midwestern mom staple when I was a kid, where you have a, a sort of handmade loom where you've got a series of threads, and then you just take strips of like leftover fabric. It was great if you had uh, a sewing machine and you had scraps of fabric where you'd be able to just sort of, you'd want to find a place to use them up. You could sort of roll them into a long strip and then stuff them down through a loom so that it gets stitched together in this way. There's a few other ways to make it happen, but doing it where you have these interwoven threads that really hold together the rags makes for an extremely robust rug that's very resistant to any sort of damage if you've got a nice sturdy material because it's all well compressed. There's lots of strength holding that together and you can make a, a piece that will last for decades with that. There's also a series of knots that you can use. This is one that's been knotted together more than used a loom. Uh, but those are all opportunities that you can have to take sort of scrap pieces of material and stitch them together into a colorful and durable rug, which is really useful in a lot of different contexts. And then another one that is near and dear to my heart, I love to camp. And so tents uh, and sails are a really important piece to think about when you're thinking about heavy duty fabric uses. And often it's with a material like shown in the bottom right here. That's a ripstop fabric where the, you see these sort of squares in the material. And the squares are there because there's an extra thick thread that runs every so often. And so it's a rip stop because if a rip starts, that extra thick thread that would otherwise be expensive and hard to make, uh, hard to make an entire fabric out of, is there every so often so that if a rip starts, it will stop when it hits one of those threads. It doesn't completely stop it. You can still cut the material, certainly. Um, but it makes it a little bit harder for a, a rip to propagate through the material as opposed to if it were a consistent strength throughout the entire thing, right? And so as a composite, you get the, the properties of both of those threads put together to sort of resist a rip or a tear, which is really fascinating. 
And then beyond that, you've also got the structure and the layout in order to build out a tent. Tents I find fascinating because you've got these flimsy fabric materials that wouldn't do anything to support or cover you as a structure on their own. But adding just a little bit of ribbing and a little bit of tension in just the right ways, you can take that fabric and turn it into something where you can sustainably live for a pretty extended period of time. I've spent many, uh, many summer weeks out in tents. It's a great time. Uh, having one that's well built can keep the bugs away, can keep you dry. You can stay very stable and happy inside of a tent, even if you know, being outside isn't your favorite thing. And so it's, it's something where you gotta have the right people that you're with and enjoy being outside that much for this to work well. But as a necessary structure, there's certainly something that can work for you to keep, to keep those essential pieces of dry and happy together if you're interested in being outside that much. And then sails are certainly another piece where you'd want this to work. You can imagine these boats both have an outrigger motor or both have a motor in them, but you can imagine that there would have been a time where the internal combustion engine just didn't exist. And your only real mode of transport would have been either a paddle or a sail. And so a sail is a, an important piece of fabric that for centuries has been part of how humans get around. So understanding how to build those, how to sew those in a resilient way so that they're stable is an important piece of what's going on. And when the fabricator in Makehaven was explaining to me, it was, it was just that it was for making boat sails. So having the ability to stitch these things together is really an important part of understanding. There's also other things that I don't want to put on this slide, like you can make your own parachute. Uh, which I would not recommend for lots of reasons, but it is sewn in a similar way. It's another mission critical material that needs to be sewn together. I do not in any way endorse you try that here. However, they do in some, some magical faraway land get sewn together so that soldiers and, and extreme adventurous can use them when necessary or when they want to. I would actually like to do that, but not, not to make my own. And so that brings us to our last section where we're just sort of exploring sort of the broad topic that is fabrics and textiles. And that's dyes, bleaches, and uh, screen printing. And that's gonna bring us into the chemistry part of this just a little bit, because as you might know, my day job is being a chemistry teacher. So I think it's an important part of understanding sort of the dynamic of fabrics on a chemical level, how they fit together. So first we're gonna talk about chemical dyes. So if you have a material, most, most materials at sort of a base level may not have much of a color to them. Lots of powders are white, lots of uh, fibers are clear or translucent. Your skin, unless it's, if it's as low in melanin as mine, it is pretty much translucent. You, you glow in the wrong context at the end of winter. That's, that's often true. And if I shine a bright light through my skin, you can see it come through on the other side. That's true for pretty much anybody. Uh, but when we want our fabric, we often want it to have a nice, bold color. And so thinking about that, the prime example that I want to bring up is just indigo, right? So indigo dye for blue jeans has this molecular geometry here, which you can see is very symmetric. There's a whole series of chemical names to go along with this. It, you can go very deep into organic chemistry to understand what's going on here. But it's the short, short, short version is that basically photons can be absorbed or pass through this material. And, and when you have this particular setup, it's the double bonds that are there that really let the color happen, right? So they, they let the blue be reflected, all the other colors are absorbed and sort of sucked up by the electrons that are in those loops on the two sides. So those loops on the edges, they, they can absorb some of that color energy that comes in, the photons of different colors, and the blue is allowed to reflect off of this material. So there's some interesting things going on here. You can naturally get it, and there's a great video about naturally sourced dyes and those materials. And then there are some good synthetic processes to make indigo, but the, either way, you're still getting to a chemical that's basically the, the one that's drawn up there. And so the structure, the actual physical shape, has a bearing on the way the color looks, which is a fascinating detail to organic chemistry, one that perhaps isn't said enough. It's the geometry of the chemical, among other things that sets the color. The shape is the color in a very real practical sense for chemistry, which is mind blowing. But with that, so if you have color and it's based on geometry, we can use another chemical agent, bleach, to undo that geometry, right? So bleach is often sodium hypochlorite, which is ready and willing 
to, uh, to move around electrons. Right? You get the sodium that comes off, you've got a chlorine and an oxygen that are ready and willing to oxidize things, to pull apart and move around electrons. And when you do that, that double bond that was critical in the middle, linking those two halves together, can be turned into a single bond. And by doing that, you change its chemical nature substantially, which means that its, its shape changes and therefore its color changes. So you denature the color and you can get this whitewash that happens where you get discoloration where previously the pigments had a certain geometry. Right? And as they change geometry, they become less colorful. They just don't reflect the colors that you want them to uh, exclusively. They'll reflect all of them, which is why they become whitish, because they don't absorb them. And so you get this bleaching. Bleach is an interesting material. I would encourage you to see its value. People really liked bleach genes for a, a period in the 90s and in the 80s. There were, there were definitely periods of time where bleaching garments was really popular. And so those are all different pieces that are interesting to take into account. Bleaching your sheets can be a good way to get them back to the bright white that you had, but you have to be careful because in addition to affecting the color molecules, it'll also affect the fibers themselves. So bleach can eat through your fabrics also. So it's a thing to be handled with care and caution. Uh, but it is an interesting process that it exists even at all. And then one of the things that's worth mentioning is that it, bleach can cause chemical burns. I would not recommend that you handle bleach directly. You should always wear gloves, proper personal protective equipment for handling bleach. Um, but if you wanted to use it to, to change the color of a material, it's totally something that you can do. So it's a fascinating process that there's a chemical dyeing agent where those colorful chemicals get bonded to materials and then bleach can undo the color nature shape or the color shape of those chemicals as well. So it's an interesting two-way street. And that's certainly no organic chemistry professor would be proud of me for that synopsis of the chemistry of it, but it is at its core at least a, a good overview of sort of what's going on, that you can do and undo the geometry of those chemicals to make the colors that you'd like to have. There's plenty of nuance and detail to that that we're not gonna be able to cover. Uh, but from there, you can also, that's to soak the color into the material to really embed it into the fibers, but then screen printing uh, lays that color on top. And so it's a, a lovely process. I'm sure Ruby could tell you much more about it uh, than I can, but there's, it's an, a great way to get a material to have a color imparted to it. So you can press, uh, if you're in the room, you can see there's a, a screen print that's up where you can squish ink through there. It's a very fine mesh and it will be deposited onto a shirt or a substrate or to some other material. And it can be bonded there by drying and it stays primarily on the surface often, like right along the surface. Some, some materials, it, it permeates a little bit more, others it's a little less. Uh, it's, one, it's an area where I'd like to learn a lot more, so I feel like I should not try and go too far into that. But one piece that's interesting about screen printing is that you can do multiple color passes, so you can get multiple color prints, which is interesting where you'd mask and overlay colors in ways that can in, lead to some interesting consequences. Uh, and then, also, it's worth saying that there's these iron-on prints. Those are not screen printing, so don't get those mixed up. They're not the same thing. They can be super useful, though. And then we'll also see these can be cut on a vinyl cutter pretty nicely. So if you wanted to make shapes and iron them on, you can buy a special material where you cut it uh, with the vinyl cutter that we'll get to in a few weeks. You can cut out a geometry and then iron that onto a shirt as well to get a different way to add color to different materials. So that may be the end of our of our slides, we like covered, there's, there, are, there are so many things to cover and we're essentially boiling this down into one and a half weeks because next week we're going to also be taking into account not only fabrics, but wearable electronics. So up here I've got a couple things. This is a little battery pack with a switch. Uh, and then I've got a series of sequin LEDs. In addition to just thinking about textiles, we're gonna also take our textiles and make them glow. So these are little electronics that we'll be integrating into, and let's see, is there any chance we're gonna get these in focus? Maybe. So these are different electronics that we'll be tying into textiles, which is an emergent trend. It's fascinating. It'll also give us a good way to, to sort of remember high school electronics, batteries, power, current, voltage, resistance, some of those things, just to get to the core of that and to blend those into your, into garments. And, and then an example of that, Another example of where we're headed next week when we think about garments would be something like this. This is my backpack. My wife wanted me to be more visible while on a bike. 
And so I've got this stripe going along the outside edge, and it's going to be hard to see in the video, but this is a stripe of material that's called EL wire. Let's see if we can get it to blink. Yeah, you can see it blinking slightly. That EL wire is an luminescent wire, so it's glowing based on a voltage that's being applied. And so if it works well, it's still a little buggy on the switch. But it does glow nicely um, so that you can get a glowing effect tied into an otherwise textile material. You have to have just the right blend of squishiness to your electronics for it to work really nicely. But we're going to go over sort of the basics of that next week so that you can not only integrate the sewing uh, and stitching and, and all of those skills, but you can start to integrate this digital piece as well, uh, which can really balloon into really fascinating things. Like I think about the wearable electronics at all sorts of levels where you've got masks that have a marquee where you can say all sorts of interesting things on them. There's, there's all sorts of options that can expand. But getting to the core of garments and how to use a sewing machine as a basic skill is a really essential part. And that's your goal for this week. So that is our talk on fabrics. So hooray. Yeah, thanks. All right. Um, next up, we want to do our show and tell. But should we take a break real quick? Or maybe, no, 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 you're feeling good? OK. All right, um, so let's hop over to, and yeah, there's the made at Make Haven. So this is me trying to model the skill of, of building stuff. That's a GIF of my backpack. I took a video of it over in a dark corner, turned the video into a GIF, added a couple of images on top of it so that it was just one nice small file of like, it's like maybe four or five frames total, but it's just enough that it adds a little pizzazz instead of just a picture. So those are all fun. Um, Oh, the, Cedric asked the question, what's the name of the thread? It's EL wire, electroluminescent wire. It's fascinating stuff. The whole setup for my backpack was like under $30 total. And there's essentially no circuit work that you have to do to make it happen. It's just a fascinating thing that you stitch on, you attach a battery pack, and it works. Fa Interestingly, it's four, double a, four AAA batteries, so it's six volts input. There's a little inverter that you can hear if you're up close to it because it ups that voltage from six to like 120 volts. So it's 120 volts, almost no current in the backpack. I have worn things like this while it rains uh, and it's totally fine. I have a jacket from my previous school that's like the school spirit logo on the back. I'll, I'll wear that next week so that I can light up the jacket while we're talking about wearable electronics. How many watts? Um, very, very tiny. These, oh, how many watts was the question? Very, very small amounts. The six batteries that are in there have an estimated life, and I haven't killed them yet, uh, of about seven hours of on time. So really, it's a long lasting thing. You can see in the room, it's not super bright. Like, it wouldn't necessarily catch your attention. Um, but outside at night, it's very useful for just being a little bit more visible or having just a little bit of light in a critical place. So it can be really helpful. I've also got, um, it comes in strips and materials. So like here's light up strips that are white. So even though they look pink now when the light turns on, they're a nice bright white. So I'm imagining like if you line a tent with this, you've got just a little bit of light that you could probably read a book by. Not a lot, but just enough that you could make something happen if you needed to. There's tons of interesting opportunities there where we can. Yeah, this is like, you know, a few sheets of paper thick. But uh, it's got a nice width. So we're going to go over some of the details with that stuff. There's, that's the whole presentation for next week. So we're headed there. So that, that's sort of my, one of my show and tell pieces because I didn't do much woodworking this week. But let's head over to the foundations page and try and take a look at, yep. We're going to hop over to, thanks. Thank you. We're going to just get to about and people. And then we've got our section with all of these different, with all of you. So we can go in order. Um, do we have everybody on the Google Meet? Are we all here? Like if I pick Ben, is Ben there? Uh, I'm here. Hey, Ben. Yeah. You good if I click on your website? Is there anything there? Let's see. Oh, I think we, we still have the wrong link. You, you had said that you updated it. Ben, can you, how, how are you doing, Ben? <laughs> Let me turn this off. Are you, are you able to hear me? Yes. yes. 
Okay, cool. Sorry. Um, sorry, I did not update it on my website, but I can. Can you see me? We're we're minute, we're trying to put you on screen. Kate gave a thumbs up. Kate, you can see me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Jr. can see you. We're just working on making sure that everybody right, in the room. Now we're here. Yeah. And we're good. Just one second. Yep. You did the inlay, right, Ben? Uh, yeah. I'm holding up what I made. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, you're on our screen now. Um, cool. So I've done some, I done some woodworking before, so I squared this board down, but then the new stuff for me was making this uh, butterfly or bow tie inlay um, at the point of a crack in the board, and then also learning how to use the router table to make these grooves and also work around the edges. So those were things that required a bit of learning, badging, et cetera, on my account. So I just made this like simple little, I don't know, cheese board or serving board or something like that. That, that sounds lovely. Uh, I, I love a good charcuterie. So a nice, a nice cheese yeah. board is always good to have. All exactly. right. Let's see. We can keep going through the website. Or now on screen, we've got a series of people who are on the call. So let's just go through the, the call. If everybody's still there. We might have just, oh, no. Nope. you want the call back? No, either way is fine. Kate, you're, you're up next. Do you have uh, anything to hold up, or would you like me to go to your website? Uh, yeah, definitely too big to hold up, but the website should work. Okay. Well, maybe Kate should cast it from hers. Oh, yeah. Then it will just be all recorded, and she can control it. Uh, apparently, you can cast it from yours, and then that will work, and it will all be recorded. So unless, unless you're not there, then we can have Corey do it. Yep. And you're muted right now. Sorry, we got a lot to ask right now in this moment. <laughs> hey, I was just trying to get to um, the page so that I can cast. Uh, uh, yeah, getting to my website slowly. That's what we were doing. I'm going to jump to someone else and I will. Uh, yeah, we, we, wanna, or we can do it and then just. We could totally. How about we get a person in the room and then we'll sort of jump through? So we'll do somebody in the room and then Kate and then we'll do a person in the room. And then Lila, and then we'll do a person in the room, and then Anna, and then a person in the room, and then Aaron, and hopefully I can remember that order. So, anybody in the room who would like to go first? Come on up, we'll gotta. All right, I need to grab the piece. Okay, cool. So grab the piece, let us know what your. That's fine. The web, if you've got something to hold up in front of a camera, we're happy to do that. Uh, we can't see the classroom anymore. The remote people. Oh, the. Um, Yep, sorry, I'm, I'm getting there. Cool. So come on up. I'll, I'll be there in a sec. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be talking about what I made. Um, I guess I can move the camera a little bit to show. Yeah, you can keep it down too here. Okay. Here, I'll, I'll do the camera while you just talk. Okay. So I made a uh, little telescope stool uh, out of wood here uh, based off of uh, a YouTube video of a hobbyist. And so if we can go to my webpage, I can start talking through that. Okay, that's really big. Uh, scroll down. And we're gonna put it, we're, we're gonna put it in this way. Okay. Okay. Too many. Okay. Too many I got control. Got it? Yeah. Go to unit projects. Oh yeah, totally. Let's see, okay, so the merge didn't go quite that great. Oh, that good, we're good. <laughs> if we can picture what happened there. <laughs> yeah, we'll figure that out later. Okay, so um, yeah, just some badges I've earned um, this last week. And so um, I 
I posted the video on the Slack last week, so I won't click into it. Um, but so I just started out drawing drawing out the plans of what I wanted to make. It's kind of blurry here, so I scanned it in. Uh, I made a modification to the YouTube video. Uh, I think it was 39 inches, 38 inches that they had in there. It was a little too short. Uh, I, I wanted to raise that up so I didn't have to bend so much uh, when, when it came to looking into the telescope. So uh, these are the plans. Okay, so uh, I pretty much bought all my materials at Home Depot. So I came in here a few days uh, to grab uh, wooden boards, the legs, the two by fours, uh, and here's all the materials that I got. Just like more here. Oh yeah, yeah. Just so they can see. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Cool. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So can you guys see the pictures okay still? Yep. Okay. Okay, so here here's all the lumber material I got and here's the components that I use to connect everything together. So uh, what I did was find the center point of one of the boards and then I drew out a circle from the radius based on the cutting that I wanted to do. So there's an image of that. Here's uh, the disc cut out. Uh, and then I routered the edges uh, just to uh, kind of clean it up a little bit. Uh, the leg braces, um, pretty much, uh, uh, or, or rather the bracer, uh, which is Uh, you'll see it in a minute. Okay, so the same technique for the leg bracer, uh, which is to hold the legs out uh, as as the telescope as the telescope uh, platform is uh, standing up. Uh, I use the same technique as I have for the top platform, uh, where I traced, I, I marked the center of the board, and then uh, traced out the radius that I needed in order to uh, support the legs at a certain distance from the top of the platform. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, I made three, uh, three traces from the center point, 120 uh, degrees apart, uh, and then I, I traced a circle from the edge, from about the middle edge of each of those three traces to make a, uh, uh, an area that, that would need to cut out. Um, so, let's see, anything... I'm forgetting. No, I think that's it. Okay, so I captured a bunch of pictures here. So, yeah, yeah. So I tried to, there was a template that was provided uh, by the YouTube video, but it was a little bit too small, so that's why I created my own trace and uh, circles that I would need to cut out uh, be in, like in the midpoints of the 120 degree uh, lines out there. So I used this little compass. It was pretty frustrating. Uh, I think we need a bigger compass. Uh, and I was a little concerned because uh, I purchased all the material in the rain. So as you can see here, there's a little bit of bowling going on uh, in the board. But it turned out not to be too much of a problem uh, as I was doing cutting and uh, uh, for the uh, surface, I mean, pretty much for the whole material to be flat after doing the cutting. So this is what I ended up with right here. Okay, so I, I did the same um, 320 degree traces from the center of the board as well uh, in order to screw on the hinges. Uh, so I cut a 22 and a half degree uh, cut off the top and bottom of the legs. Uh, that would, uh, they're par parallel to each other and pretty much allows the folding of the legs. Um, and I've also uh, routed out a lot of the edge and the center of the leg in order for it to be uh, a little bit lighter because it's kind of big. So here's the 22 and a half cut. Uh, here's the routering. Uh, there again, these are the edges. 
table and I marked the board about the center where I had this bit that I just drilled out a whole bunch of wood from. And this is a finished product. So uh, some things that I'd like to do later is uh, get shorter sc uh, screws for the top of the platform that is protruding over the top platform here. The screws are a little too long. Uh, yeah, router additional grooves because it's still a little heavy. Uh, sand down the, r the routed edges because there's a chance for splinters. Uh, and I guess stain it and varnish it. Uh, just to give it a little more, uh, you know, class. Yeah. 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 Color so. color yeah. Very, very nice. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Okay. Next step. Do we think the is you Kate? Kate? Yeah. Kate, you ready to go? I am ready. Oh. Um, Great. Let me try presenting and see you guys can tell me the first. All right, presenting now. Um, so you all saw, hopefully you're still seeing this. Um, you all saw uh, sort of halfway through the project last week. Um, I was continuing on the um, uh, chandelier that I was making. Um, put some of this on Slack. My first um, tongue oil experience went really well. Um, this is where it got a little I was a little nervous about the wiring um, because I hadn't done wiring in quite a while, but I did meet up with facilitator Rich. Uh, we had some virtual facilitator hours and um, he talked me through a plan, which was good. Um, got to play with meters, got to break open some wires, um, got everything kind of um, laid out, um, a whole lot of wires <laughs> with the junction box. Um, I have some more notes about the changes that I made to the original instructions, sort of suggestions that I had. I don't know how this will work. We'll see if it. Oh, lovely. This was my shock. Um, not electrical shock, but um, just astonishment that it actually turned on. It was pretty exciting. Wi-Fi, thank you. Eliza is telling, saying it looks better in real life. And then here's just a picture of sort of the, um, where it is now. Um, it's not installed yet um, <laughs> because we need to have a, um, an electrician come in and, and fix one of the, the wires in our actual house before we can put it up, but, um, but did get through all of, you know, nearly everything. The other thing I want to do is there, I want to build a, a fascia around the outside to cover the, the box and the tops of the bottles. Um, the original plan had a small one um, but I decided I want to build it up a little bit bigger to show the top, um, to cover the top and all the wires that kind of go through there. So I need to get a little more wood because the original plans had a smaller box, but that's where I am. That's really cool. Very nice. Yeah, that's exciting. You, you jumped, uh, jumped right in there with building a lamp, which is an exciting process. And I was, we're, trying to find a place to build, to put lamp making into our curriculum a little bit further down. So you're gonna be the pro when we get to that, Kate. Uh, it's, a great, it's a great project. It looks awesome. Um, next up, who did I say was next? Somebody else who was live, and then it was gonna be the next person in the call. So, uh, anybody, Ada, you wanna come on up? Tell us about your experience. My project, oh, let me get my iPad on. Um, so it's hit a few hiccups, a few technical issues. Um, th this was the, uh, the design again. Um, the, the front drawer is something that I'm doing separately with other techniques. But um, the basic shape was the woodworking project. And um, so that required 
cutting CNC cutting a whole lot of identical shapes out of um, the Baltic birch plywood to layer together to get the stripe pattern. Um, and had a lot of trouble with both CNC machines um, this week. It turns out uh, the big one uh, had a broken part on it. Um, and uh, it was cutting beautifully. Like the, um, so th the shape of this part is not quite correct. Um, yeah. But uh, as you can see, like the, there's like basically no tear out on either side of the piece. Um, the only thing that's left, you know, the only thing I had to do was just uh, break the tabs to get it out. Um, but that's without any cleaning up. And it's pretty smooth. Um, but that machine was not aligning the cuts properly. Um, so eventually, after a couple days of trying to work with that machine, um, I went and uh, I decided to do a cut on the Shikoko, um, which uh, did not go as smoothly as, as I had hoped. Uh, the first test that I did with the Shipoko was good, um, but I, it seems that uh, I think, I, I don't know if it is the, the like, uh, um, the step motors for the, uh, for the positioning apparatus for the Shipoko or what, but um, I, I'm going to in a second. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it uh it just was not cutting cleanly and it, it uh started cutting like progressively less cleanly uh as it went through the cut um and um so there was like serious tear out on the bottom of these pieces you can see here like the the top is totally clean but this is like really kind of gnarly. Um, uh, that was not the only issue I, because of that. I think in part because of that tear out, um, the pieces in between the pieces would were popping out um, and then causing issues hitting the bit. Um, and then also, uh, I don't know if it was the an issue with the motors or it was, you know, putting it through its paces a little too much because it is a dense material and the quarter inch bit while like, while within the, um, the realm of what the Shipoko should be able to handle is like definitely at the upper end of it. Um, but, uh, it, the cut just stopped like about six times. Um, over the course of cutting out the shapes. And then uh, the machine had a lot of trouble re-zeroing itself to, the, to its previous zero point. Um, and several times it uh, select the previous zero point, but it would get it wrong. Uh, and it would be off by like, uh, I mean, it was like a, maybe three millimeters or something, but it ended up being a huge, huge issue because uh, the holes are all drilled first and stuff like that. So um, let me, so like uh, uh, you, you can see here, what side am I on? Uh, there. Or wait, yeah, sorry. Right, so like here, um, you know, it stopped in the middle of a cut and then when it restarted, it got its zero wrong and it just cut through another piece. Um, and that happened several times. So there's a couple pieces that I think will be salvageable, um, but to a, certain, to a large extent, I think the Shipoko is just not powerful enough. And so uh, Lior has been, well, Corey and Lior and I have been all doing a, a lot of stuff to figure out the issue. Lior figured it out 
uh, today and is working hard at like replacing the part. Um, so I don't real the only final product, which is not a final product, but that I have to show from this week is this block of laminated together Baltic birch plywood, um, which the the leg supports are go are going to be carved from, but uh, the Chipoko is absolutely not powerful enough to do that. Um, so that's something that, uh, you know, the design is set up and ready to go to be cut, but um, waiting on that machine. Um, so it's a little bit of a tour through troubleshooting the CNC, um, but that's what I got. There's, it's, it's worth saying, I think, that there's lots of things to learn from your failures. And I was not in any way expecting anybody to hop into a CNC project this week. Um, but I'm glad you did, because we got to mess around with the big CNC and turn it on and use it for the very first times. We're going to have a whole unit on CNC products. So you're all going to learn the skills that, that Ada was playing with this week. You're each going to get to make things on that big CNC. And it's really good that if it was going to break, we broke it now instead of the week where we're all trying to use it at the same time. So way to go. Thanks for being out in front. <laughs> You're saving us all headache later. So thank you very much. Um, so let's see, who's, who's next up on our list? Was it Aaron maybe, I think? I think that was the name that I had said. Uh, Aaron, are you ready? Or was it? Yes. OK, sure. cool. Yeah. Are you going to be um, presenting your screen? Sure. All right, we're ready for you. Okay. Let me get that going. Can everyone see my browser? Yes. Okay. So, um, this was awesome. I, I really enjoyed myself. Uh, even the mistakes were like, I was giggling and getting excited about it. And I just like, firstly want to say that I, I got a lot of help from, from people, uh, just around like, uh, Kate, you know, you were, you were there sort of like, I don't know, just a familiar face, being able to like hop back in and be like, okay, cool, I'm here, I can, I can focus on, on some stuff. I got, I met a, a gentleman named Dave who uh, helped me with a couple of the cuts that I couldn't do. Uh, big shout out to, to Ruby as well. She helped me go shopping for wood. So I just wanna say first and foremost that this felt really, really good, like from a community standpoint, being a part of this uh, and that this wouldn't have been possible without it. That's it, if there's anything I can, do for you and, and your journey, please let me know. So uh, I feel like internet rules are you gotta you gotta post the uh, the finished goods first, right? So uh, I built a moss wall, and then with a couple of my uh, mistake cuts, I decided to make uh, a wine holder. I wasn't really sure if I would succeed in it, um, so I only stained one, figuring that I could maybe figure out the second. But basically. Um, I started off with, with just these mistake cuts, um, and this was a lot easier than I thought, but what was interesting, and again, uh, Lior was really kind to sort of point out to me that um, my wood was behaving strangely, and the reason that was is because I was using a pretty aggressive uh, spade bit, so, uh, that it, it literally just pulled the wood right up to the drill press, so it was not the right thing for me to use. <laughs> As a result, it kind of made a mess. Uh, so he was like, well, why don't you, why don't you use a Forrester bit? And I was like, okay, I'll give it a try. Um, and that worked out awesome. Never used a Forrester bit before. Didn't even know what it was. Um, you know, but I got to like change the gears on the drill press and use like the, the sheet that has all those suggestions of the speed to use and all of that. It was great. And the results were a whole lot better. I, uh, I did a little bit of sanding just because I didn't want to get too aggressive with it. Um, and I just like sanding things. So I, I basically just did some sanding and then some staining. But 
the moss wall was pretty cool. I um, Corey also helped um, just getting some advice on how to go about cutting the wood the way that I wanted and executing on a, on a plan that I had. And I wanted to give it some depth. Uh, so in this instance, I decided rather than have the board face facing me that I was going to flip it on its side and, and go for it that way. But with a little bit of wood glue and an hour later, I was able to, to put some finishing nails in it. I have a tendency probably to over secure things, but it just kind of felt good to put a hammer on something after a long day at work. Um, so after after I did that, um, I had the, pretty much the finished thing. I just needed to give it some sanding again before uh, going ahead and giving it a red oak stain. I had some extra red oak stain kicking around, and I, uh, I particularly liked it. Here's the uh, the uh, a piece of a, a, a two by two sheet of plywood. It's court, uh, eighth of an inch plywood that uh, a gentleman by the name of Dave cut for me, and. Uh, so this is like kind of the funny part is I think the most difficult thing was actually remembering to take pictures and like thinking about what am I actually doing and is it a step? Like how, how like if I was reading this on the internet, would it look like that? And the answer was no. Like I just sort of did it. Um, so I, I, want, I personally want to be more cognizant of what I'm doing because I got carried away and I forgot to take pictures of me putting uh, some styrofoam in a black past plastic bag, hot gluing it, securing uh, the, the plastic top to the styrofoam, and then hot gluing it to the inside of the box. Uh, so as you can see, I was kind of like halfway done by the time I realized. Um, and uh, so that's what I did. And then I finished it up, and um, I'm, I'm pretty pleased that I have it right here. I hung it up. Um, another thing that I didn't take a picture of is that I put like a little like um, hanging, I don't know what this is called. I don't even know if you can see it, but uh, so that way I can hang it up. And uh, I'm really pleased with it. Yeah. Thank that, you. Yeah, that, that was lovely. Um, it's nice just to see the, the piece come through. And it, I think you're, you're right, you speak to a truth about it's hard, you get carried away and you forget to take the pictures. And then you realize how much work it must take to be a blogger, <laughs> like to yeah. have taken all the right pictures and put it all together in the right way. Like that must be much harder than we all, than I think it is. Um, but beyond, yeah. Yeah, awesome. Um, cool, and then we should have an in the room person. So Ruby, you're ready to go. And then after that would be uh, Lila or Anna, whoever's gonna be next. Hi. This is, I'm gonna try not to look because it's, it's gonna be very distracting. This is what I made, this is my plant. Um, his name is uh, can Cantaloupe. Um, and I used the lathe to make this pot. Uh, it was really uh, nerve wracking, but very exciting. I got badged uh, last week. And could you pull up my website by chance? Um, yeah. So um, basically, I glued up a bunch of pieces of pine on top of each other um, and uh, clamped that together, let it dry. Uh, I used the bandsaw to like, saw off the edges. Um, we can scroll down a little bit. Yeah. So glued it up. And then further down, there's a video of me actually turning it. Um, some pictures of, of it on the lathe itself. Um, and then that's the video up there. Um, and of this I think was just uh, turning it um, on the inside so like the inside of the, the pot itself was the most difficult just because it it's it doesn't feel right in in the sense it doesn't feel like that's what you're supposed to be doing because there's so much friction and it's so rough um, and yeah that that that's about it I don't really know what else to say how, uh, how did you put the text across the front? 
Oh, right. So I laser cut um, the name using the laser cutter here at Make Haven. Uh, I threw together a little text that I made, turned it into um, uh, a vector SVG file on, um, using Inkscape. Um, and I sort of had to just like put some like, so it wouldn't roll away in the laser bed because the laser bed's flat. Um, I made like a makeshift, very trashy jig and just put two pieces of like stuff next to it so it wouldn't roll away. And uh, yeah, that, that's basically it. Cool. cool. And then it's a walnut stain. All right, very, cool. very nice. Uh, great job. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's, that, that has got to be the happiest plant around right now. Brand new home, it's feeling good. All right, so we've got, let's see, next up, who, uh, who was it that's virtual that's going to go next? We were, no, you're good. Let's see, in the, in the call, we've got Lila or Anna, either, either one. JR, or whoever unmutes first, you get to go next. We're working on our end. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yes, we can hear. We can hear you, Anna. And we're getting to the <laughs> point where we can see you in a minute. We're on our way. Oh, yep. If you present uh, or just show us what you want to show us, you can. You can do that. Um, I'm gonna show you. Okay, that's totally fine. Okay. Um, so I was working on a shelf, but it's still like in the basement, the tongue oil is still drying, it's not finished. Um, but I started experimenting with um, macrame. Um, so I started with a really simple knot and I just made like a netting. I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> we, we, we don't seem to be getting um, an update of your video. Uh, uh, let me try. Hold on. Let me reset my video really quick. Okay. That work? No, we're getting nothing. Ah, <laughs> uh, this is frustrating. Okay. Uh, might have to skip me then, because I think my connection's too weak. Sure, that that's fine. Okay. You were, yeah, you were doing some awesome stuff. I saw you, what was it, maybe Friday, uh, where you were working on your shelf where you had welded together pins. You're just going at this in, in all sorts of crazy orders, and I love it. It's great. I'm, I can't wait to see the, the pictures when they get updated, because I'm sure it'll be a lot of fun. Um, but let's see. Next. Yeah, it, it's, it's definitely like ready to be assembled. It's just the waiting for the tongue oil to finish drying. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Lila, do you think you could go? You would be our last virtual person. Are you ready to just jump in? Yeah, I'll go. I can go. Um, to present my screen, I just open it and hold on, I'll see what happens. Yeah, no, you're good. Uh, a window, a Chrome tab. Okay. There you go, you're doing it. Yeah, so that's where I am. I haven't stained it yet, but I just kind of wanted to show everyone where I am at this moment. I kind of just picked a traditional woodworking project and I followed directions out of a book. Um, I don't know, I, I don't know what to tell you. I'm not the most chatty person. Well, I can, I can talk a little bit. It was fascinating to watch this happen because you just went through uh, like you knew exactly what the next step was and it was awesome to see. And the, I think the splines that you did in the miters were a fantastic example for lots of people to get their heads wrapped around what that was. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So I, I kind of just was thinking of finishing it with some the oil that you use on like a cutting board yeah, that sounds good. There's, um, what, 
were the different oils? We, we had stains that were used this week, tongue oil for Kate, a um, few different oils and stains that would be neat to use. And so there's, there's lots of options for you. Yeah, and I, I don't know, I was also um, playing around a little bit with the Shiboko yesterday. I must have, I feel like I got good use out of it before I broke. I don't know if it's very appropriate, but I was playing around with that with uh, some resin, and I was going to get it ready for today, but I read it needs to settle for 72 hours. Yeah. So, I don't know, I was playing around a little bit with a little cover. Oh, cool. Yeah, there we go. That'd be fun. Yeah, that's, the, where I am with that. that's great. Yeah, resin you'd want to let set before you like sand it or machine it. You definitely want to let it set for a long time because uh, it's a chemical reaction that needs to finish. So we've got that. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah. You want to come up and? I, I just want to clarify, uh, especially because uh, Lila, you were trying to help me with the shpoko yesterday. Uh, the shpoko is not broken. Um, <laughs> I figured out what issue, we, well actually Corey figured out what issue we were having, which was that um, it, the, um, the safe height was set too high and it kept hitting its limit switch and then the whole uh, jogging system just shuts down and you have to restart the whole thing. Um, and so that was happening every time it got like raised to a safe height because it just kept bumping the limit switch each time. Um, I mean, the Shpogo gave me other problems, but that was more like the density of the wood and the size of the bit and, and other stuff like that, but not broken. Yep. It, it works. It's all, it's all good. It's just tricky. There's a lot of quirks to a machine to do cuts which is why we're gonna have a whole unit that ramps up to that skill. But next up, uh, Jamie, do you wanna talk about your experience this week? Sure. Uh, is my website? Oh, you want to yeah. Yeah. Just start talking and- Okay, um, well, I'm doing um, a van build. I'm doing two actually. Um, so, um, I have to start somewhere with the build and it's the floor and every, I wanted all the, you know, what I use to be very light. So I'm using half inch Baltic birch. And the first thing I did was start with the floor. Um, and then um, I used the, the floor mat. I was lucky enough to have the floor mat that came with both vans um, that I'm gonna use to use as a template. And so I lay the, the wood together uh, from, for the van I'm living in. It's, well, you can play that if you want. Um, it's two pieces of four by eight Baltic birch. Um, one of them's cut in half perfectly. So it's two by two feet. And I traced around it, cut it out with a jigsaw um, use the router to smooth the edges. Oh, and not smooth the edges. Um, I actually splined the pieces together with half inch, uh, flat aluminum. Uh, and then I made a bed and I also, um, I, I did document it pretty well, but it's just not on the website or in that video. Um, but if you go down the, you know, through that, that page, um, you scroll down, you can see. Um, when I design the furniture, I have to find the center line and then build the entire layout off of that. So once I found the center line and account for the half inch, um, I basically broke the van up since it's six feet wide, two by two by two. And um, with the bed, I have one side, it's a dinette bed. So one side um, and a cupboard is, uh, 24 inches, the other side's 24 inches, and then I have a 24 inch space where I put a 24 inch tabletop on two lips that hold it. Um, cool. So, yeah. and we talked about the, there's, there's, there's tons of, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's the spline. Yeah. yeah, that's really cool. Anything else? Where, where'd you get it? Where, where'd you go? Um, so, 
my uncle is a carpenter and so he got me this wood wholesale price and it was worth going to Maine just for that alone. Um, so when I got there I thought I was just going to pick up the wood and just maybe throw a floor together and come back and um, he had a day to give me and he's a good carpenter so I got some help and he he kind of advised me on just how to do it and we went step by step and it you know it took a couple of days but um, I have a bed and yeah, yeah so it's an Great. actual home right. thanks Very nice. uh, awesome so there's there's lots to take away from woodworking there's a ton of variety in what people have taken on which is really exciting it's really neat to see what people are doing uh, and to see that experience. We got, um, and Hala was taking a, a bit of a break week, which is going to happen to all of us. And so there's lots of different pieces to take into account to make sure that we're, that we're, that we're growing and learning and, and trying new things. And I think it was awesome to see all of the different projects. And I really hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did to like see what other people were doing also to see like, this proliferation of skills and to, to have a little bit of time to see what was new to you that you want to try next or what was fun to see someone else have a new experience with that maybe you already had a skill at. Uh, there's a ton of interesting things that we're doing this as a cohort. And I really liked that oftentimes there were several of us in the wood shop working together. It was a neat way to make it happen that we could have that sort of shared experience. Uh, and so I hope that in future weeks we get to do that again. Uh, and as we do, we're going to move into textile. So it'll be exciting to see sort of what happens, what the game plan is. There's definitely some material over there under the table. So if you wanted to just hop in and get started, there's, there's some things that are available to you. There's some thread that's over there. Um, and it's pretty easy to download a template for a mask in 2020. So if you wanted to just make a face mask, you could probably crank one of those out really quickly. Uh, but there's tons of other great options also. So. Sorry, can I add two quick make haven things? Totally, yes. Okay, um, just as we're wrapping up our woodworking um, section, I'm gonna send the feedback form around. Oh, um, I'll put it in point. Slack and you'll get an email. Um, so while it's fresh in your mind, if you have a chance and have any feedback to give on the, this unit as we pilot class, that's always super helpful. Totally. Um, and then also a reminder, I love seeing all these projects, they're so great. Um, and it would be really cool if you have any sort of final photos, if you could post them on Slack at Made at New Haven on that channel, so people outside of the class, totally cool. um, other members can see it as well. Yeah, that'd be good. The, the common phrase that I'd like to, maybe we can stick to a common vocabulary, your hero shot at the end, the like really nice picture that is just the right lighting stage, whatever it is that makes it a nice photo, a good hero shot for a project is perfect for Made at Make Haven. So that's a good thing to have in there. Um, any other business items for to think about with the class? Any, I'm looking at JR and he's saying no. So I think that that's it for the night and we'll leave the call open. We're gonna probably stop recording in a second or two, uh, but it's exciting to see where textiles are gonna take us this week. Oh, question, yeah. Yeah, come up and ask. I have very cold hands and feet. Um, and so when I was living in my car last year, I basically had myself completely covered with multiple like sleeping bags, blankets, stuff. And I want to know, like, are there ways to just make heated clothing that runs off of very little power or rugs, or, like something to like warm up the space in a way that, huh? Yeah, like I have heated socks and, you know, I, I know about heating blankets, but like, you know, stuff like, yeah, like, like a hoodie or just things. And that stuff like really runs off of a lot of power. That's the problem with it. Like it, it would just blow through whatever solar I collected for the day. And even the heated socks, take, I noticed they just took up a, like a lot of energy to recharge. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was looking at your light and that, that thing can run off for seven hours. Yeah. But like at night, that's about seven or eight hours of sleeping. So just something that's, that maybe could, you know, run that long or even longer and could charge up much quicker and with less power, just like the most efficient 
like way to heat up clothing. I'm like, I'm just curious, like, is there like, like there's conductive thread and stuff like that, but how, you know, I'm just curious if there's things that just could be done that haven't been done. Sure, let me, let me try and respond with the microphone. Yeah, there's, there are, there's totally heating pads. Um, we, we don't necessarily, I'm not sure actually, I need to look. Some 3D printers have heated beds uh, and those come with conductive elements and then like a heated steering wheel is another thing or like heated seats in a car. Those all come from passing current through a heating element and it's often a lot of current, like a low voltage, high current scenario. So it is gonna burn through energy to generate heat that way. There's some other, and it's on the fly, so I don't have a great answer, but there's definitely some exothermic reactions um, that you could look at to see if they're reversible, where like the chemical reaction would generate a little bit of heat. Uh, and I'm thinking it would probably be more of a burst of heat. Um, there's, um, there's, there's several things. We need to look around, but I think that finding one that doesn't require a lot of electrical energy is what you're really hoping for. Yeah, and that, that's gonna be, a, a reversible reaction would be like, there's, and I would need to look up the details, and it's been a while since I've done this, uh, but I'm going to do it with kids at some point this year, is a hot ice thing where you have a super saturated salt, and then when it precipitates out of reaction, it generates a fair amount of heat. That could be useful for a short burst, and then you play with your saturation levels over the course of the day to get it ready for the next time it's cold and you wanna do it again. Um, but it, we need to look into some logistics. The heated, the electrical heating pads would totally be available if the power usage wasn't an issue. Right. So we'll, we'll have to take a look at that, but that'd be a fun one to look at for the next couple of weeks for yeah, sure. Yeah, it's not so much the, the, the product, it's, it's the energy it takes that the talent to the engine well, it's a It's a reasonable engineering constraint to say, I wanna do this thing, but I have these constraints and then trying to find solutions that work within those constraints. So those are all pieces that we can that we can consider. Any other questions, thoughts, concerns while we're still like all as a whole group or should we just hop to like mingling, chatting and, and done recording? Done recording, okay, let's do that. I think we're definitely done recording. I'm curious, does anyone have an idea what they're gonna do for their textile project? I'm just curious. Oh, yeah, come on up, Ruby. So, you said done, you want me to stop recording? Yeah, you can stop recording. Okay. Is this, okay, so, I